thank you, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your Sunday uh, and joining us. Welcome to the 2023 Bloom, uh, Brooklyn Book Festival Virtual Festival Day. And for those of you in New York, hopefully this is a nice break from the, uh, the rainy afternoon we're having. My name is Alex Costas. I'm part of the Bloomberg Connects team. Uh, Bloomberg Connects is a free app that allows you to access and explore hundreds of museums, gardens, parks, and cultural spaces from around the world uh, from anywhere, anytime. Our mission is really to open up access to arts and culture so that anyone everywhere uh, can discover and learn from amazing cultural institutions. Uh, we have been a proud supporter of the Broken Book Festival for the past two years. It is a true New York City institution and uh, one of the many reasons why New York City really is one of the greatest cultural uh, and creative centers in the world. Um, and speaking of amazing institutions, I'm thrilled to be joined by representatives of two of our cultural partners. Uh, we have Chris Bench from uh, the Vice President for Collections at the Strong National Museum of Play, AKA the Strong in Rochester, New York. We have Liz Williams, founder of the Southern Food and Beverage Museum, AKA SOFAB, uh, and of the National Food and Beverage Foundation, and Leslie Sam, the Chief Librarian at the Nunez Community College Library, where uh, so fab passer collection. Um, today we're talking about lifestyles in the library. We're talking about two incredible collections that really are focused on things that all of us should hold uh, quite near and dear to our hearts, uh, food and toys. Uh, I am going to, we're going to walk through what these institutions are all about, dig into their collections, learn from the origin stories of these th three fascinating panelists, uh, and really hopefully get you excited. Uh, we are a virtual presentation, but the aim is that all of you will hear these amazing stories and book your, tri book your trips to Rochester, New Orleans, uh, to visit all these wonderful folks in person. So without further ado and enough of me talking, uh, let's dig in and learn about our panelists. Uh, first up, Chris, can you kind of give us, introduce yourself and give us an overview of what the Strong Museum is all about? As Alex said, my name is Chris Bench. I'm Vice President for Collections and Chief Curator at the Strong National Museum of Play. We're the biggest museum of toys, dolls, games, and video games, and everything else related to play in the world with more than half a million items in our collection and a library of about 230,000 resources give or take a few. And our goal is to represent especially the history of play in North America from the last 250 years, let's say. And we do that in ways that we try to be engaging for people of every age. And, and Liz, over to you, introduce us to SOFAB. So SOFAB is, um, just about to be 20 years old next year. Um, we are a food museum and what we try to do is cover the food and beverage cultural scene. So we're talking about this historically as well as to the future. So it's something that um, makes you really happy since everybody eats every day. And uh, we have a wonderful... Um, partner to SOFAB the museum, which is the research center, the SOFAB Research Center at Nunez Community College. We have about 40,000 volumes in the collection about just about everything to do with food and drink in one form or another, as well as thousands of menus and cocktail napkins and all kinds of other ephemera that's often very much fun. And, um, that uh, is housed at Nunez Community College. And Leslie, interest, introduce us to Nunez. Hi, so I'm Leslie Sam. I'm the head librarian for Nunez Community College Library. Uh, so Nunez is a small community co uh, community college in St. Bernard Parish, uh, specifically Shelmet, Louisiana. Um, we are here to serve our for public as best as possible, uh, including students, faculty, and staff for the, for the, for the college, but also the St. Bernard Parish uh, at large and also the greater New Orleans area and globally um, as best as possible. Uh, the library itself, we're here to uh, collaborate with 
um, virtually anyone that's willing to work with us to uh, better um, market and get the uh, library uh, uh, resources out to the greater public at large. And um, again, just to uh, to be some type of uh, support, some type of a uh, resource and um, a catalyst to uh, everyone that's willing to um, come in and enjoy the library. Thank you. So, 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 Chris, how does one accumulate and uh, amass the world's largest collection of toys, games, dolls, and everything related to, to play? How does what is what is the origin of of the the Strong's collection, and how does one come up with all that good stuff? It's really helpful to start as the only child of wealthy parents, something that I didn't manage to do in my personal past. And our founder, a woman named Margaret Strong, was born to wealthy parents, collectors. Her parents met this guy in Rochester named George Eastman. He asked them if they'd be interested in investing in his new company. The Woodbury family bought Kodak stock, they had a family principle of never selling Kodak stock. So at the time of her death in 1969, Margaret Strong was the largest single stockholder in Eastman Kodak. And that gave her the resources to collect whatever she wanted. Uh, in sadness in her life, her, her daughter and her husband predeceased her. That left her with psychic energy and space and time to collect, and she did that omnivorously. Amongst her favorite collections were toys, dolls, and games, and that continues to form the core of our collection at the Strong Museum today. And we've been building on that ever since. Since 2002, our mission has been exclusively dedicated to the history of play in all of its dimensions. And that's allowed us to hone our identity and our collecting focus in a way that we couldn't in our earlier days as a broader museum of American popular culture. And and, and so Liz, we, we, now we understand having wealthy parents can allow you to, to amass the largest collection of toys uh, and games. Uh, how does one amass an, an incredible collection of, of food-related ephemera and study and, and, and history? Well, I think that when we decided to open the museum, we really were filling a niche that wasn't filled. And we said we wanted to collect the material culture of eating, as well as other things attendant to that, like books and other ephemera. And once we let it be known that we were doing that, people started to ship us things. Uh, people found out where I lived and left things on my front porch. I mean, it was amazing. The outpouring of, of gifts that we received often left without a note or anything. And um, it was it was really actually amazing. And I think everybody had something from their Aunt Sarah in their garage or something and they knew it was too important to throw away but they really didn't want it and so they were so happy to have a place that would care for it and showcase it and um let people other people enjoy it that we really have received an outpouring of gifts and and how did you find yourselves in partnership with uh, Nunez Community College well, that started because I moved to St. Bernard Parish, which is the home of Nunez Community College, and um, realized that they had space in their library that had been um, it, it had been emptied because of the change to a digital format for all of their paralegal programs, and so. The chancellor and I, who chancellor of the college is very, very forward thinking, said, I asked her if we could have space there. And she said, yes. And we've been there happily ever since. As a, my, my father was a lawyer and had a like a law library in his office. And as they downsized, they were surprised to find that the collection of old law books that they had spent decades and decades amassing had no home except sadly uh the, the dumpster um so, so leslie i know we, we're hearing a bit about the uh the, the, the sofab collection what else can one find you're, you're the chief librarian of the of the overall uh library collection what, what are some of the things we can find at, at nunez outside of uh, sofab's collection 
So um, when you first enter into the library, uh, you'll see, well, if you're familiar with the library, you'll see that the uh, library design, uh, the space is different um, than what it used to be. It's been about four months now. Uh, we redesigned the space with the furniture to make it more uh, welcoming, more of a collaborative space um, for students, for faculty, staff, everyone to come in and just enjoy it and uh, work together uh, to do work or just to study and quiet um, to make as much noise as possible. Uh, you also find that we recently uh, established a fresh market as well, which connects to the library. So you'll find fresh food, uh, snacks, drinks, so on and so forth. And students and the community at large is welcome to come in and to uh, eat, drink. Um, as long as you're not at this computer, you can't drink. But um, and just to roam throughout the library and uh, have conversations. You also find that there's books, obviously, on the uh, second floor, the stacks. But you also find that there's computer uh, computer stations, but we're also in the process of creating the Islangios Museum and Archives, uh, which is something that's going to be able to um, uh, market out to the to the greater uh, New Orleans area um, about the Islangios community, which is a community from the Canary Islands that moved to um, Louisiana, uh, uh, New Orleans, St. Bernard specifically, about two or three centuries ago. Uh, yeah, two, three, three, two or three centuries ago. And they have a very rich, very um, elaborate culture. And it's very prominent here. And Dr. Tinney, Dr. Tina Tinney, the uh, chancellor of the college, she's uh, very uh, passionate about getting this information out to, to uh, the, the, uh, the public. So um, we're still in the process of getting it started, but that's something that I'm very excited about. Um, I was able to help participate in writing a grant, so on and so forth, but uh, that's uh, something that's available as well, or will be available. And I, and I wanna touch on the idea of like, who is in the collection, representation in the collection in a little bit, but you know, Chris, going back to you, you mentioned uh, that you know, your, your collection expands and, and includes things from, from modern times, and obviously that, uh, you know, have been collected since your, your founder uh, passed away. How do how do you accumulate and where where do things come from? How do you keep amassing uh, new collections and new pieces uh, as as you grow as an organization? Well, as Liz was explaining, people are really eager to find good homes for their items. It's a uh, something that lots of people, especially often as they age or downsize or go through some of the other transitions in life, say, this really needs to go somewhere. And in contrast to places like or forms like books or recorded music, or there isn't a name that goes on the front of a famous, even million seller toy or game. And there are people who feel like my story is going unheard. It's invisible. This is maybe my chance to have a claim to fame and a sense of what it takes to produce a product, whatever, if it's a video game, if it's a stuffed animal, there's a lot of people, a lot of thought behind that. So people are giving us their archives, that sometimes paper materials, their hard drives, their schematic drawings, it's all sorts of things. It is those sort of reflective moments. And we recognize that we have an obligation to preserve these important stories from as many disparate types of creators as possible. So we're particularly interested in people in the toy and game business who have perhaps been under visible over the years. So female creators, people of color, we are especially keen to collect those. And we've had some great finds in those areas in recent years. And and Liz, you mentioned something we spoke earlier this week that that uh, Hurricane Katrina had a, a real role in kind of the growth of your collection and, you know, expanding and, and you were kind of a safe haven for a lot of these kind of priceless kind of uh, mementos and, and objects for, for people. Is that, can you, can you touch on that a bit? Sure. Um, it's really true that when a whole community loses everything because of a flood or horrible other disaster, um, 
it, it makes you realize that you holding on to everything um, isn't perhaps the best way to preserve it for the future. And I mean, no place is of t- going to escape every kind of disaster. But I think that um, if you're in an institutional building of some sort, you are often in a better position to preserve something than a person in their home. And so because of that, um, so many people lost their cookbooks and their recipe collections during Hurricane Katrina. We had a library and people were who had libraries were saying to us, we need uh, we need access to these to a place to send these books. So we partnered with the New Orleans Public Library, which had lost everything because of mold. And they kept our books for us and made them available to the public while everyone was trying to reconstruct their their food um, memories. And of course, that's really important in this culture here in New Orleans because food is really important. And it's kind of central to the to the culture. And so that was how we got started. But then once that happened, people started to feel that what we were doing was important. And we have many um, archival uh, shelves that are covered with minutes of various food meetings, whether it was a local supper club or other kinds of of people who got together about food, as well as people's handwritten uh, cookbooks and uh, that that are very personal, that belong to their mother or their grandmother or an aunt or someone. And it's it's been really wonderful to have both the home cooking side of things represented, as well as the more um, outward looking chef, hotel, caterer side of things. It's it's a really great mix that we have, which has been really, we've been very fortunate because people seem to be willing to share all of it. And, and so a question for, for uh, Leslie and, and Chris on the, so you, someone brings in this amazing collection, uh, they send Liz a box, which we're not encouraging anyone to do, uh, of their their precious memories and recipes from their family. How does one in in the kind of institution in the library side? How does how do you document that? How do you capture that? And and now does that mean that inside your head you have another box of materials you have to somehow be able to draw upon and and share as people come in? So what, what is the process of someone like receiving? What do you do when you get a big box of of goodies, Leslie, uh, from from Liz? So when it comes to SoFabs donations, uh, Liz and her her team. T- uh, tackle staff themselves. Um, so they have their own process for uh, processing the books and uh, cataloging them and that, and that type of thing. Now, if you want to talk about our the library's personal archives, we have a process that we follow. Um, so uh, since I started the, the, the position about nine months ago, I've learned that uh, the first step in the process is to first go through our property properties team, properties department, where they're going to document everything, uh, label it so they can track uh, what's come in and that type of thing. And then we have forms in the library where you can uh, fill out um, what you donated, uh, deeds of gifts and that type of thing. Um, and you understand what's going to, what it all entails when your collection is going to be within our archives and our archives. Um, and then uh, we also make that information available to the public through our uh, cataloging system, our library management system. Um, and then from there, uh, we have it processed and uh, uh, you're able to um, uh, view it if you're a researcher or someone from the public that just wants to come in and look at the information and view it. And Chris, you were mentioning that recently uh, someone, I don't want to misquote, 70,000 catalogs, game <laughs> catalogs or toy catalogs, like how does it, and you, is it a similar process that Leslie described of kind of bringing that massive volume of things into your into your system and making it available to, to researchers and game fans? It It is. Fortunately, all 70,000 of those catalogs didn't arrive in one fell swoop, uh, but they arrived incrementally, admittedly with an initial donation of 15,000. And once 
there's sort of critical mass that sometimes develops. And maybe Leslie and Liz have experienced this. Liz made some reference to it. There's sort of a gravitational force so that one person says, my 10,000 catalogs went to the Strong Museum. They're interested in catalogs. Then more and more people sort of get that through the kind of grapevine amongst collectors, specialists in an area. And that's how we've amassed almost 70,000 toy and game company trade catalogs, the kinds of catalogs that went not to consumers like the rest of us, but to retailers who were being asked to stock these products on their shelves before the toy business got consolidated to Amazon, Walmart, and Target. So it was a big deal. And these are unique documents that have advertising designs. They've got suggested uses, they've got kids posed with them, they've got price lists. It's a resource that people around the globe have found helpful and that we continue to find great ways to employ. Is that a similar thing you're finding, Liz, on your end that, you know, someone mentions, oh, I just gave my my collection or or this set of materials and uh, menus and napkins you were saying to, to SoFab and then it's kind of word of mouth travels. And I, and I believe you've had different, your, your museum has grown in size and shifted locations uh, over time as a result. Is it, is it because once people know there's a source or a place they can send their materials, uh, everyone just kind of starts sending it in? Pretty much. Um, I, we, have, we have more than once had people f- send us 20 boxes of things un- unannounced and it's like okay what is this then you start unpacking it and you think oh my goodness we should get in touch with these people and get their story and learn more about them and why they sent this to us often there was a note left somewhere um and these people have actually passed on and they're deceased and so you can't talk to them anymore and um they've just said this goes to sofab and that's it that's all that's there um, but other times you can actually talk to people. But but yes, people find out that you have a core of a particular subject and then they start sending their things to you because they want to be part of that collection. And often I think that people have two or three things of something and they think, well, this isn't really a collection. I can't donate just two or three things. No one will care about that. But if they know that you have 600 of them already, two or three more might be nice. And so they'll be happy to send them to you. And and, and just before, because I'm, I'm anticipating that everyone right now on this Zoom, uh, this, this program is looking around their houses and, and, and their drawers right now. Just uh, how would one, what do you consider collection worthy? And what were the things that people on this, uh, on the call, like how would they approach uh, for, for all of your institutions sharing materials, like what is what is that process, the ideal process look like? Um, and, and what are the sorts of things that you're looking for to, to grow your collection? Is there an area, is there a type, or is it kind of open for interpretation? We, we love to not get things unannounced on our doorstep. Uh, that is problematic, but we would prefer to get lists or descriptions sample photographs of what you're talking about is helpful, a sense of scope. Is this the three things that Liz was talking about or is it 3000 things? That makes us weigh, how does this fit with what we've already got? Does it fill a gap or does it duplicate something? And we weigh all those items carefully. We have a queue of things that are waiting to be processed because we've had such volume come through our fire hose. And uh, if any of the folks on this call today are professional archivists, we are actually interviewing for an archivist position. So you could work in the world of toys and games if you have that want. And I think that uh, we feel the same way. It's really a good idea to get in touch with us. You know, we're not very old. And so in the very beginning, I think we were sort of um, free about accepting donations because um, we didn't have anything. And so anything you gave us was a good thing to have. And in the very beginning, for example, when we opened our doors, 
just to be able to have enough for exhibits was sometimes a struggle, even though once we did open, people started to donate more and more, and it really made it much easier to have some depth and breadth in the, co in the collection and for exhibits. But in the, the book and ephemera department, it's very easy to become overwhelmed. And um, so, you know, if someone is a collector, it's always a good idea to get in touch with us because nobody wants to um, ship things and then find out that they aren't wanted or anything like that. So we definitely feel that um, although we love the impulse, it's um, it's still better to talk to us about it beforehand. Everyone on the call, pause first, take some photos, do some documentation. Uh, Leslie, you were mentioning this, this new collection that you're working on uh, from the community from the Canary Islands. How did that come about and how did, how did that all get gathered and, and, and collected together? Uh, so my understanding is that um, some of the items was donated from the Islenos, uh community uh, in St. Bernard Parish. Uh, I'm, I'm still limited to how much I do know, um, but from my understanding, that's the case. And that, uh, again, because the uh, chancellor of the college is also a part of the Islamic community, is something that she's very passionate about. Um, and also, uh, uh, um, Nunez, uh, I'm forgetting his first name, uh, excuse me, it's, it's slipping my mind at the moment, but she's related to a very uh, prominent figure um, in, in St. Bernard Parish, who's also uh, part of this, the community. So um, just being able to get this information out and so that the uh, again the the, the 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 public at large, the public um, globally, I, I want to say, because it, it does have a global reach, um, uh, is something that's very important, and um, in, you don't want to allow this this rich history to just slip to the wayside. So, um, not to um, over uh, elaborate on this this topic, but again, um, I do want to highlight that it is something that's very um, important, very very exciting. I think, and once it's, it's up and running, I think that our researchers and those who are interested in Spanish history, uh, uh, Louisiana history, would be very interested in this. And that's just something that you know, just riffing on this idea. You know, we had a, a panel last year at the Book and Book Festival. And one of the topics came up of representation. You know, the, the folks were from large institutions in New York and the collections were impressive, incredible, priceless, one of a kind. But what the conversation was about is that the collectors themselves were uh, generally all men, generally all affluent, generally all white. And while the collections were certainly impressive, it gave a very, very specific view of, it was, you know, through one lens, you know, what was of value to collect was through a very singular lens. It seems for all of you that the, the nature of food, the nature of toys and games and play and the nature of kind of Nunez's role within the, you know, the, the parish community, that there, that this is maybe less of a challenge because there are ways to kind of give representation to, to a, a greater group. I think Liz, you mentioned, uh, the idea of kind of women's voices and then kind of the role of, of women in, in culinary uh, in, in the history of food is, is something you can, you're able to touch on. There was a great story that uh, Leslie gave about um, uh, the Filipino community that, you know, I didn't realize was the first in, in the U.S. Uh, and Chris, you made some mention of some recent um, collection uh, expansions you've made in this to, to make this more inclusive and to show kind of a broader spectrum of uh of, of faces and voices in your collection. So is that something that you're, you, you are able to kind of touch on? Oh, absolutely. We, um, we're very mindful of the, it, the issue. Um, and it's, when you're dealing with cooking, it really is pretty easy to include women, uh, especially if you're talking about women in, in the home, um, when you're talking about food. Um, but we are also very aware of some of the very special relationships between, in the past, especially between uh, white women in a home and the servants or enslaved people that were also working in the home who were probably the ones actually doing the work 
as opposed to the white women. And so we want to make sure that all of that is documented appropriately. And um, that even if, and we have a lot of this to deal with, um, this is, you know, from early times in the South, there's a lot of racist um, books that were written often by white women about the kitchen. And although they often will recognize the either enslaved women or people who are descendants of enslaved women of African descent who worked in their kitchens, the the material is so condescending and so unpleasant to read but nevertheless documents number one that that period of time existed and we shouldn't forget that it did and act like it never happened and number two that it was the women of color who were actually developing the food and um and that should not be overlooked and so sometimes you just kind of have to deal with it um and uh, so sometimes we take those books off the shelf and we make them available when someone requests them, but they're not just there because we sometimes don't always um, feel good about who might come and read those things. So we are trying to be a little bit um, protective. So, um, but in other in in other ways i mean we have so many everybody is eating so there's no way that you can escape the fact that we all eat all of us as as humans as animals as whatever we are and um and so that at least makes it possible for us to um cover everybody in in our in our books and ephemera and collections and do, do you see, Chris, you know, everyone plays, everyone plays differently, everyone contributes to to play. Do you see that just by, by virtue of that diversity of voices in, in the collection? Or is that something that you have to be very, as you mentioned earlier, mindful and thoughtful uh, about and proactive about kind of amassing? We're most mindful of collecting it in terms of the people who've created toys and games. So one of my thrills this summer was to acquire a group of about 140 prototype tabletop games, board games, card games from a Jamaican American man uh, from New Hampshire. Uh, seems like maybe not the first place I might settle uh, as a black man, but he was there. He created these games. Some of them came to commercial production. Others did not. But to see his thinking creative process is fantastic. And it helps increase the, the breadth of our representation in our tabletop game field. And then one of the other sort of landmark people in the world of video games is a man named Jerry Lawson, a Black engineer and inventor, who was the first person to come up with the concept of a cartridge that went into your video game system, that this was not built into your system that you could swap out games. And so he was integral to what has become a bigger business than movies and music put together in terms of video games. So he was integral in that. And Jerry Lawson is a person who was unseen for a lot of time, but has become visible because his personal archives and documentation are at the Strong Museum. So I want to get quickly shift to, to your own origin story. So I always find that quite interesting how how you arrive uh, where you are, and then I want to you know finish off with kind of your 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 best kept secrets or the things that you find most interesting and have the most personal connection to within your collection. So, you know, Leslie, starting with you, uh, you know, library sciences. Uh, I've had the good pleasure of working with many folks uh, in in my career on the corporate side who are archivists, records management people, and they are the most fascinating uh, people at our organizations. They know the history and are able to kind of recount uh, and 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 tell a side of your organization that otherwise you may not know. So big, big thumbs up to the the folks in the world of library sciences. So how did you enter into this universe and and, and world? 
Um, well, and if I can uh, go back for a second, uh, the name of that collection is Frank Fernandez. It's Frank Fernandez collection in our, in our archives. Uh, so, I mean, I was living in the San Francisco Bay Area about uh, 15 years ago and basically needed a job. And I had some library experience working for uh, Delgado Community College as a work-study student in uh, around 2002-2004. So um, I got the position as a library assistant at Napa County Library. Then I moved back to New Orleans, uh, worked for Xavier, and uh, the director of the library asked that I get a library science degree um, from the University of Southern Mississippi. And I must admit that I'm, I'm ashamed because I had never heard of the university at the time. But when I looked it up, it seemed very, uh, just seemed like it was just the best idea to go to. Um, so I, I uh, took the, uh, I went into the program, I got the degree. Um, I got a librarian position at Fort Polk, um, um, Fort Polk uh, Army uh, location uh, in Le well outside Leesville, Louisiana. Then I applied for the high up head librarian position here at UMass. Got the position, fortunately, and um, I've been here since, and I've been loving every moment of it. So basically, uh, it wasn't planned. I just fell into it, and I've been here ever since. And and, and Chris, how do you how do you just one uh, oversee and become? the overseer of the largest collection of toys, games, dolls, and game-related things in, in, in the universe. I didn't realize that that was the path I was going to follow exactly, but when I was in eighth grade, I wrote an essay that when I grew up, I wanted to go to the Winter Tour Museum in Delaware and study American material culture, how things are used and made by people, everyday people, and wind up becoming the curator of a historic house. And lo and behold, decades later, that is exactly what I did. And I've been in my position at the Strong Museum for 34 years. I've evolved as the institution has. I never thought I would need to know Barbie's middle name, which is Millicent, in case you get that question on Jeopardy. You are, you can thank me for that. And uh, it is something that has been a, a great place, a, a obviously a place that I feel like I fit, I've made a difference, and that is suited to my storytelling and my history skills that I've brought with me. And and Liz, close us out in the personal origin story uh, segment of this lovely, lovely afternoon. Well, I, of course, um, am a recovering lawyer. And so um, I was one of those people who became a lawyer because I didn't know what else to do. And um, and it was, I'm old enough that it was at a time when you really couldn't get a job if you were a woman, um, unless you were going to be a nurse, maybe a doctor, um, or a school teacher. And um, I didn't want to be any of those things. And so somebody suggested, oh, well, you could be a lawyer. And I thought, okay, sure. And so that's how I became a lawyer. Anyway, um, after after a while of practicing, um, I really, and I had always really been interested in food and the only way to really study it was to become a person who had a degree in home economics. And I wasn't really interested in that. And so I just let it go, except as a personal interest, not interested so much in cooking, but interested in the culture of food. And, um, so just doing everything that you do to get by, I accumulated a bunch of skills and ultimately said, oh, I can do this. I can start a museum. And um, and that's what happened. And uh, and started really without a collection and started just asking people to lend us things. And a lot of people said, oh, I'm so glad to be able to give this to somebody. It's yours. And so that's how we got started. So we're, I think we're, we're nearing the, the, the end of our time. So I want to go through um, kind of the, the quote unquote secret of your stack. So, you know, rapid fire questions for all of you. What would be your most memorable thing you've acquired in your time uh, at the library that you've received in a box or been, been hit? Leslie, sorry, what, what's the most interesting the things that come across your desk for, for the first time? Oh, I myself haven't uh, uh, received anything. Um that since I've been here, that hasn't been anything to happen, but I have had the privilege of seeing the library uh, progress and transform um, in ways that uh, surprised me because again, as Liz mentioned, the chancellor of 
the college is very forward thinking. So she is always looking to uh, move into the 21st century for the library. So I have to say that the library overall is something that's been very impressive to me. Liz, how about you? Well, I think that the thing that I found the most in interesting most recently is that we received some Braille cookbooks. And it was um, something that I had never even really thought about. And I'm ashamed to admit that, but it's true. But the idea of reading the recipes and then uh, cooking, because you always get all kinds of things on your hands and whatever while you're cooking. So then having to wash your hands and go back and, and read that cookbook with your fingers, um, it, it just was an, an amazing idea to me. And the idea that we now have Braille books in our collection is also very exciting. Chris, how about you? One of the collections that's most asked for in our archives is the works, the documentation of the Atari coin-op division. So if you think of the Atari 2600, that was the breakthrough console into home gaming, uh, think of the arcade games that Atari's coin-operated division made. And we were fortunate enough to have someone who had gone dumpster diving when that company went down the drain and had salvaged schematics, documents, all kinds of things, thousands of them, some very large scale, some things that would have been really hard to, if not impossible, to replace. And now that is one of our core most asked for collections. And it's uh, the virtue of realizing that things can be scavenged all sorts of places, including in a dumpster outside an office park. Let, let me see if I can, after four years of being on Zoom, do this properly. I want to share my screen. I believe this is what you're talking about, Chris. Let me see if this is it and tell me, uh, are, are we all seeing this? Is this a schematic uh, that you're talking about here? This is the kind of thing that illustrates how they were thinking of what their cabinets would look like. How can this be more than just a one person experience, which we all, I think, have an understanding of in an arcade environment? How can it be something that multiple people can share simultaneously? And so this is the kind of thing that Atari was engineers, designers, marketers were doodling and thinking through how can this work? So this is a great example of the kind of ideation and concept development that goes toward making either a hit game or one that might never reach market, both of which are fascinating evidence. And and this next one, a question for all of you, uh, the, the oldest, what is one of the oldest things in your collection? Is this, I have no idea what it is, Chris, but it seems quite old. It doesn't look like a whole lot of fun, admittedly, but how does this fit in into a, a, a game collection? Uh, all right. This is a one of, I think, five original manuscripts of the poem known by its formal name as A Visit from St. Nicholas. We know it better from its first line, "'Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse." And it's that poem by Clement Moore in Troy, New York in the 18. 20s, I believe, if my memory strikes me correctly, that really formed a lot of our images of what Santa Claus is, does, looks like. Santa Claus before that time was a saint, a Catholic saint. And this is a right jolly old elf who flies through the air in a reindeer toad sled. And all of our lives, for better or worse, have been impacted by the images that went along with this poem. Liz, how about you? What would you say the oldest thing you've received or, or gathered in your collection might be? Well, oh goodness, the oldest the oldest thing is uh, ah, what is the oldest thing? We have some interesting seventeenth um, century barware that is really very interesting, and um, it's it's late seventeenth century, but. Still, um, you know, that's important. And and also we have some um, forged tools that were used in the late 17th century in the sugarcane fields. Um, also, uh, for, I, I don't know which ones would be older, but they're about the same period. But one is very fine 
and beautifully engraved and made of silver and the other are forged of uh, cast iron. So it's a very interesting contrast. And, and Leslie, on your end, in, in the Nunez collection, uh, what would we say is the oldest or most interesting thing that, 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 you've, that you've come across in your time there? Now, I was quite surprised to come across in the stacks, in the, uh, the library stacks of uh, books, literature that's uh, dated to the uh, 19th century, the late 1800s. Um, I was surprised to find that, you know, located in the stacks. Uh, I think that was something that could even be in the archives itself. So um, I was glad to see that the college had those type of, of materials that dates that, that far back. And, and now here's one. If you could take home one thing uh, in the collection, obviously you won't do this because it's all owned by the institutions. Like, what would be that one thing that you've seen you'd love to like hang on your wall or or have in your personal collection? Like, what's the thing that you just get most excited about, Chris? Let's let, let's start with let's start with you again. You're not taking it home; it's all staying at the strong. But if you could wave a magic wand, what would that item be? I think it might be the Sears wish books from my childhood, those catalogs that came out each holiday season. I know that I dog-eared lots of pages for my parents to look for things that they were gonna put under the tree for me. I got very few of them, but I could fantasize endlessly. And uh, that is probably the thing that would have the most sort of personal power to me. How about you, Liz? Well, I, I really love some of the uh, mortars and pestles that we have that are made out of all kinds of different materials. And um, it makes it, you know, they're fun to use. And they, because of the different surfaces that they're made out of, the same things uh, crushed in them are, are different and have different properties. And I would love to have that array at my house just for the whim of it. <laughs> How about you, Leslie? What are you adding to your uh, your your break front or dining room table? So we have the complete biblical set of uh, commentary that, that includes the Old and New Testaments um, that has to be worth over a hundred to a thousand dollars. Um, it's something I would love to get my hands on. As you said, I can't because it's owned by an institution, but I, I'm very excited to see that. Very nice. And, and you know, before we wrap up, just any... Any kind of just how about one last kind of overview of how folks can can find you all and and you know so that when they do buy their bus tickets plane tickets how does one get involved in uh, and experience you all in person Chris how about you how do we get to Rochester All right Rochester if people don't know is in western New York we're about ninety minutes from Niagara Falls so I tell people to come see two wonders of the world Niagara Falls and the Strong National Museum of Play and you can find us online at museumofplay.org and we are about to announce the uh, finalists in November for this year's National Toy Hall of Fame. So be watching for that uh, the 9th of November, I believe is the date. Liz, how about you? Well, of course, our website is southernfood.org. And um, on, on that, you'll learn all about the museum as well as our research center. And um uh, in uh, October, actually today, later, we're opening a new exhibit called Documenting Dinner. And it's all about home menus that people have developed and used over a 40-year span of time every Thanksgiving, which I think is a just wonderful document of their, their Thanksgiving. Um, we also, in October, at the... Um, Research Center are opening a new exhibit called The Sweetest Crop, which is all about sugar. And um, we have our annual domino lecture on October the 12th at the auditorium at Nunes Community College. And Ken Kalb is going to be speaking about um, food deserts, which is also really fun. And I do want to say this about us. Every time we open something new, we get a very large piece of French bread, and instead of cutting ribbons, we break the bread. So I think you have a picture of that. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to send right afterwards. And 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 I think we're about to we're about to wrap. So so Leslie, I will we'll, we'll save time. We'll, we'll send your information out afterwards. I want to thank you, uh, Liz, Leslie, and Chris for joining us today. Um, remember, you can. Uh, Please consider making a donation to the Brooklyn Book Festival at the link below uh, and learn more about our three panelists. Uh, next 
Sunday is the fe festival day in downtown Brooklyn. If you're available, please come down, meet thousands of authors, uh, experience uh, a day of books, and join our in-person panel, which will feature Sam Roberts from the New York Times and folks from the Hispanic Society, New York Botanical Garden, and the Louis Armstrong House Museum. So again, thank you to the three of you. We could have talked for hours and hours. I hope to another date. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Sundays, and uh, bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.